History X, the dreams and the lives connect. From revolution to conquest, we stand to correct. Text, thirsty for alternative anthropology. This is the message, the action, truth without apology. I wrote these words almost 20 years ago in my youth when I felt disenchanted and disconnected from America. Before I had taken the leap to become a policy professional to shape our democratic institutions with my own hands. The truth is, when you are disconnected, you are the most vulnerable to malign influence and disinformation. Just as I witnessed friends and people who look like me in their frustration succumb to efforts to undermine their political will, they were convinced to forfeit their right to vote because they believed the sophisticated social media narratives arguing that this democracy was not for them. This was the case in 2016 and long before but technology and social media have exacerbated those malicious attacks on our rights by domestic and foreign state actors. Thus, our discourse on disinformation must stem from the marginalized racial, ethnic, and other communities who were the targets of these attacks. There is only one way to advance an alternative anthropology that is affirming, inclusive, and drives us toward a future of equity and justice. We must give voice to those who have yet to contribute to our shared solutions. Hello everyone, and welcome to TrueCon 2020's panel, Disinformation and Maligned Actors, the lead up to the 2020 election. My name is Josephine Lukito, and I am an assistant professor of journalism and media at the University of Texas at Austin. And I am thrilled to be moderating this panel today. I'm joined by three fellow panelists, Nina Jankowitz from the, uh, the Disinformation Fellow at the Wilson Center, Cindy Otis, the Vice President of Analytics at the Athlea, El, sorry, Alethea Group, and Catherine Marr, the executive di director at the Wikimedia Foundation. Thank you all for joining us. So we're just gonna start right off into it uh, with the first question. What can we anticipate disinformation to look like in the lead up to the 2020 election? I'll jump right in. Um, I think we're going to see a lot less of trolls and bots and networks of inauthentic accounts and a lot more information laundering. And in fact, all of the um, takedowns that we've seen so far that the FBI has tipped off Facebook and Twitter about have been this sort of information laundering operation where uh, a malign narrative is laundered into our information space through more trusted vectors, whether that is a website that looks like it is supposed to be a partisan or a local news website, uh, whether it's making its way in through the halls of Congress, as we've seen in, in some cases, um, or whether it's being laundered through authentic American voices and things like Facebook groups. I think, um, you know, the way that I think about this issue at the moment is we're in a very unprecedented sort of situation where the broader context is that we're having a presidential election during a global pandemic, um, also at a time in the United States where there's national unrest over police violence. And um, there are a lot of sort of hot button issues that are occurring on a daily basis. The newest news, of course, is that the president has tested positive for coronavirus and members of his staff as well. And all of these sort of create this, this situation where uh, disinformation actors, so those who are using false information as a weapon of sorts or a tool and a tactic for their various reasons, um, these are the kinds of chaotic situations where they can slip in and either amplify narratives or sow narratives. And so, you know, as an investigator, somebody who spends their day and nights, frankly, these days, um, investigating the kinds of narratives that are circulating, there's a lot of domestically generated misinformation about all of these topics. And so for a disinformation actor, there are all sorts of opportunities to seize on these kinds of narratives and simply amplify them because they're already being you know, generated domestically by Americans themselves. 
I think Cindy said exactly where I was going to go on this is it really is, uh, I think this round around the issue is going to be misinformation that becomes that is perpetuated by disinformation actors. And I think what we are really looking to is certainly the the narratives have changed over the course of the last few weeks from from questioning the integrity of our mailings, uh, vote by mail systems into questions around, uh, you know, the way that ballots are going to be received, whether there's legitimacy to these ballots, there's going to continue to be an effort, of course, on on suppressing the vote through through questioning this integrity. But really, what I I'm looking at is uh, the period after the election as well. So that 24, 48 hours in which the information advantage is going to go to those who call uh, uh, call the shots or, or sort of try to establish um, facts on the ground relative to what their upper hand is and who is one. So I think that that's really the period that we're looking to. There's going to be a lot of misinformation potentially due to the way that our electoral systems work within the body public. And then that creates an opportunity for disinformation activities. Awesome. Can we just quickly clarify what the difference between misinformation and disinformation is? If anyone wants to take that question, <laughs> I, have, I have a very layperson's analysis. So I, I, I look to our to our academic experts here who do this as a as a professional research topic. Sure. So disinformation is the use of false or misleading information with malign intent. Misinformation is the same thing without the malign intent. So that's, you know, your crazy aunt or uncle who loves conspiracy theories and shares them at the Thanksgiving dinner table. That's misinformation. They're misinformed. They're not necessarily doing that with malign intent. But I do think um, I would definitely underscore what Catherine and Cindy have said, that disinformation doesn't have to come from outside of our borders. In fact, what we're seeing in 2020 is so much disinformation being uh, amplified and created by hyperpartisan political actors and fringe media outlets, and, um, and frankly, uh, amplified by political figures as well. So um, it's not necessarily something that has to do with a border or who the malign actor is. In fact, it's actor agnostic. Totally. And as Catherine had mentioned, disinformation can become misinformation and vice versa. Cindy, you were saying? Oh, I was just going to say that, you know, in terms of narratives that um, that I'm seeing ahead of the election, a lot of it is focused on exactly as, as Catherine said, so just would echo what she said about um, voting related information. So misinformation spread by individuals who just don't understand how the process works, but then individuals who are um, intentionally being misleading about the actual process of voting um, and that sort of thing, or whether, you know, um, we've been looking at messages that people have been getting from individual actors claiming that a person isn't registered to vote when they are. Those kinds of narratives um, that different individuals will intentionally spread to discourage people from actually showing up to vote or maybe casting their ballot at all, whether through the absentee you know, process or in person. And then the post-election, again, exactly as, as Catherine said, what we're concerned about is, you know, the amount of false information that will that will swirl with claims of, you know, potentially, you know, fake votes being, you know, fake ballots being found or personal stories of people claiming to have, you know, um, first person uh, information about seeing something maybe happen at a polling station, these kinds of personal stories that are extremely hard to vet and verify for folks like us who try to hunt this stuff every day. Um, it's this sort of, you know, what we're anticipating is a lot of claims that will come out on election day and afterwards about, well, you know, I saw this particular shady thing happening at a polling station that builds the larger um, lack of trust in ultimately the election results. And if I can just jump in there and kind of weave this into something we heard on Tuesday night at the debate, um, you know, we heard President Trump encouraging his supporters to go out and watch the count at polling stations. And as somebody who served as an election observer in, in countries abroad before, I think what Cindy just hit on is, is really important. So one of the reasons election observation um, is so important and it's done systematically where you have coverage of the entire country is because one incident 
that happens in, in one polling place or even you know tens of incidents, that doesn't mean that the entire process has been undermined. Um, and I think we are going to be seeing a lot of those isolated incidents coming out. I mean, if you look at coverage of, of previous elections where much less has been at stake, we've seen some of that stuff getting blown out of proportion. So I would caution um, those who are listening just as citizens or members of the media perhaps, um, really understand the context uh, of, of the election that's happening. So many ballots being cast, so many different rules in different municipalities and different states. Um, and really when we're looking at uh, you know the the actual voting process. We need to be looking at it holistically and not just with these isolated incidents. And and frankly, do our best not to uh, amplify those isolated incidents that are hard to confirm and don't necessarily reflect the entire picture. That's a really great point. And we've already seen a, a small trickle of some of these types of stories related to improper ballots or quote unquote ballot harvesting and other such terms like that. So we can, I, I suspect we'll see a lot more of that, especially as we get much closer to the election. I think also playing on, I mean, some of these narratives, these narratives have, have existed for a long time at this point. Um, there was a particular um, fake website that was created in, in 2016 by an individual who wrote straight up, it was Ameri an American individual who wrote up straight up um, fake stories completely made up out of his head. There wasn't a grain of truth in them. And they claimed, you know, that they had, that there had been this warehouse that was discovered. It was full of, um, of fake ballots marked to vote for Hillary Clinton. The website was taken down in short order because of a, uh, an investigation that uncovered this individual. But that story, which is again, a hundred percent false is still being brought up by certain elements of, um, you know, American um, groups th as evidence that this has happened before. Um, and so seeing how, you know, these narratives have been ongoing for quite some time and they've been built upon and used as evidence to continue making the claims today has been really fascinating and of course, very troubling as well. And relatedly, I want to kind of turn back to a, a comment Nina was mentioning about domestic and international or foreign actors. And I think this is really important to think about the fact that disinformation and misinformation is spread both by foreign actors and by domestic actors in groups. Do Are there differences between the way these two types of actors or groups operate? Do we see or do we see some similarities between them? Well, I've been saying recently that the disinformation playbook has been democratized. You don't really need to, you know, be sitting in a Russian security services building uh, and and have a background in covert operations to do any of this stuff. All you need is a social media account. Sometimes you need a credit card, and you need a basic understanding of how social media traffics in emotion and segments people by vulnerability. Um, and I think uh, Russia's gotten very good at that, but I also want to underline the fact that, you know, Russia's approach is more like throwing spaghetti at the wall than it is this kind of master plan. They have the resources, both human and monetary, to just keep throwing their spaghetti uh, until they see what sticks. And frankly, social media allows them to run that sort of A-B testing on a, on a constant basis. So if you think back to 2016 um, and the, you know, uh, disclosures about Russian ads that were bought, uh, there was this narrative in the media at the time that like, oh, some of these didn't do very well. That's because the organic content actually did very well. And what the ads allowed them to do was kind of test their messaging. Um, and the most successful content there was the organic content. So um, the, the thing that I think is really important to know is that most disinformation is trafficking in emotion. It's not something that's going to be a cut and dry fake. It's not just a silly Photoshop. It's going to, you know, really needle in to, to those very visceral emotions. That's why we've seen so much disinformation during coronavirus because we're all in this uncertain, fearful situation. So everyone's quite vulnerable right now. Um, and the most engaging content online is often the most enraging content. Uh, so if you feel yourself getting really emotional, the best thing you can do is take a step back and not share that content to practice some informational distancing, right? Um, but I think there's actually way more in common 
then there is uh, things that differentiate the domestic from foreign actors. Of course, the goals are different um, and the goals are different among foreign actors as well. With Russia, the idea is to denigrate democracy and pit Americans against one another, uh, keep us occupied at home. So we're ignoring what the Kremlin is doing abroad. Um, with China, I think the, the goal is a little bit different. It's more traditional propaganda, painting the CCP in a positive light, denigrating Western actions, American actions, but not necessarily that chaos goal. And then domestic political actors obviously usually have themselves in mind um, and have a very self-serving interest. But I would definitely be curious to hear what Cindy and, and Catherine have to say from what they're seeing uh, in the spaces that they monitor. One of the things that I think is really interesting is how much the transition has, uh, how much of a transition has occurred from 2016 to 2020 um, relative to the conversation around fake news versus disinformation. In 2016, I think there was a lot more of an emphasis uh, on what Cindy just described in terms of false news sites that were meant to replicate the look and feel of credible information sources. But to Nina's point, which she just underscored, and I'm sure Cindy knows this too, of course, is that really what we're seeing is attraction on social is far more problematic than the sort of uh, ersatz news information. And so that's really where you're going to be looking to is this much more organic content. Um, and the challenge that we see relative to the news media, and I know we're going to talk about that in a little bit, is how much the media now relies on social to be its own driver of stories. Um, and so you see really sort of laundering of misinformation that happens through genuine, potentially uh, uh, not malicious intent with regards to sort of the more mainstream press uh, as people pick up things like um, Twitter posts and the like and talk about what's surfacing in terms of overall narratives. Now, ideally in a, in a, you know, a tight editorial environment, you're not going to see that at national publications, but certainly on election day when people are chasing stories relative to a local news interest, there's a lot less oversight uh, in that really more grassroots or sort of local news environment. And so I think that that's some of the risks that we see is the is the laundering of narratives into sort of legitimacy. And unfortunately, as we know, through research around fact checking and corrections, uh, it's really who gets that who gets that out there first, it's not the follow up um, that that resets the narrative for folks. And so the moment you hear something is going wrong at your local polling station, or there's unrest in the center of of your city, and that's the piece of information that's going to stick with you, not the follow up and the correction. Yeah, I completely occur, um, concur that um, websites this time around aren't sort of as getting as much engagement as social media posts. When we look at um, different networks of individual threat actors pushing out content, it is primarily through um, through social media posts. And it's because it's, it's pretty, I mean, I don't want to say easy, but it's 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 sort of easy ish um to sort of blend it's in easy. uh in the chaos right i mean there, there's um, not good content moderation or oversight on a lot of these platforms you're totally right it's easy uh, absolutely sorry i didn't mean to cut you off <laughs> no. no 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 i'm glad to, i'm glad to <laughs> to hear you say the same um i mean it to nina's point earlier um it, it's cheap. It's cheap to create a fake um, social media account. You don't need much, um, maybe a burner phone in most, you know, in some cases, maybe not even that, maybe just a quick Gmail you, you popped up with. Um, so, and there's no sort of consequences for doing so. So if your um, sort of half-baked social media account gets knocked offline, well, I mean, you've got 200 others, and, you know, depending on the threat actor using them. So, um, and it's very easy to blend in, not cause too much of a ruckus, by simply amplifying what is again already being generated by Americans themselves who have a better handle on um, you know the English language um, sort of cultural nuances um, and that sort of thing and just sort of sit there and and retweet or you know share and use the hashtags that are already trending absolutely and as Catherine had alluded to there is this linkage between social media and news media right and so some of my own research has found that the Russian IRA accounts that were quoted in news media, they were quoted for sharing opinions, not necessarily factual information, but some sort of example of Vox Populi. This is how Americans, conservatives, or liberals are feeling right now. And so this link between news media and social media, I think, makes it such that it's super cheap to make these uh, accounts, but it can be really, really beneficial in terms of getting attention by these broader amplifiers and news organizations. Yeah, I think very often news media does the work 
uh, you know, for for the trolls or or whoever is looking to create that misinformation. But I also think that you know, um, there's a real challenge relative to our actual understanding of civics in this country. And so when we talk about the election, uh, the whole presumption that the news media calls the election on election night is is really it's a tradition. It's a television show. It's not actually the way that uh, presidents are are chosen. Right. When we think about when the electoral college meets, when Congress certifies the results, most Americans are not familiar with this information. And, and, I, and that gets into this uh, responsibility relative to coverage. It, there's, there's almost something for me that's in between disinformation and misinformation, which is a, it's in for the information void, but it's also the absence um, of, of contextualized, clear explainers that allow for the American public to sort of follow along what's happening uh, as we go into this process, right? So we all know that 50 states have 50 different regulations relative to the way that we do mail-in voting, relative to the way that we certify our votes, when we can open them, when we can count them, when we make the determinations, you know, what the role of the legislature is, and then and, and so on and so forth. The complexities build outward from there. And so it does feel to me that we're actually, um, we're shooting our own self in the foot uh, on this information conversation. It isn't, uh, yes, there's always the influence of malign actors. I'm not trying to diminish that, but we are as responsible for what goes on in our own house um, on this particular election. That's such I a good totally point. Agree with that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I totally agree with that. My own research in Central and Eastern Europe shows that you know, those resilience building activities, things that people don't necessarily want to invest in or think that won't solve the problem quickly enough, things like media literacy, digital literacy, digital hygiene, um, and yes, absolutely civics classes are things that really contribute to building a resilient society. Even though we have, you know, Russia and China as malign actors today, we might have another adversary tomorrow, or frankly, our own domestic disinformation that is undermining democracy. And until we build that resiliency, we are going to continue to remain vulnerable. Um, but there does need to be some resiliency in the media as well. I've been pretty frustrated over the past couple of months with certain things that are getting uh, written up in very reputable news sources that frankly uh, should not even get a drop in the bucket. We're doing the amplification, the work of the trolls for them. And um, there have been a couple of instances where uh, Russian websites and social media accounts that of course they are you know, clearly uh, parroting the Russian narrative have been given uh, not only entire features in outlets like the New York Times, they're linking to them directly there. So an, an outlet or you know, outlet, if we're going to call it that, a, an account with 5,000 Twitter followers suddenly um, is going to be you know, immortalized in the United States paper of record for forever. Um, we should really think about that oxygen of amplification and whether or not it is worth uh, creating that feature, writing about it, or whether it's better to just write about the types of tools and tactics that people should be on the lookout for. No, it, it is, it's not as sexy of a headline as, you know, Russian health misinformation. Um, but what is going to be better in the long run in terms of, you know, isolating those actors, number one, but also educating the public about the types of things that they need to be on the lookout for, that manipulation, whether it's coming from a foreign source or domestic. I keep thinking of the the recent example we had a couple of weeks ago, and it may have been longer than that, but time is sort of blending together this year, um, about the story that appeared um, in a Russian news outlet about claiming that um, Michigan's voter files had been hacked by the Russians. And it set off this day long sort of firestorm of, um, you know, even among people who consider themselves, you know, political experts, election experts, and things like that, you know, spreading this claim that that these files had been hacked when a simple Google search, I mean, literally, a, you know, a simple Google search would have shown that these this information is publicly available. Um, and that's how the that's, you know, that's how voter files are, are held in Michigan. Um, and I think our tendency is to when we talk about, you know, arming um, the public with the, the information about um, the election process and all of that, we often sort of look to underfunded voter protection nonprofits to do that work when really, you know, as as being underfunded as they are, one would expect, I mean, they're, they're trying, right? But it's, it, we need a comprehensive strategy that builds on that resilience that um, I think Nina and I have talked about now together for, for hours and hours about, you know, um, the, the education, this, the serious investment in education of the general public we need to do on these issues so that 
the day long, you know, sort of story on social media isn't something that is is very easily Google Googleable um, to prove that it's that it's not correct. Totally. Yeah, and I think it goes back to Catherine's point about these information voids, right? These spaces and places where um, the information hasn't come out yet clear in, in a cohesive way. And I want to dig into that concept of the information void and what we can do to um, make sure that there's good information during those times. Yeah, I mean, my familiarity with the term. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Nina. <laughs> no, no, it's all right, you go. <laughs> I was just going to say, I, for the the idea of an information void, at least my familiarity with it comes through the organization Data and Society and the work of Joan Donovan and Dana Boyd, who are two researchers, um, I think, who really created the concept and popularized it. At least that's my understanding, uh, which is this idea that very often what it is that we're seeking uh, leads us to information that is not accurate relative to what it is that we're seeking, but instead takes us into the pathway of misinformation. So say you're seeking information around do vaccines cause autism instead of getting information that says no, vaccines do not cause autism. And you get um, information that le that that questions the premise and sort of takes you on this pathway, as we know, through sort of algorithmic intention uh, down the YouTube rabbit hole around around this particular topic. Um, and very often the reason is, is that uh, institutions are, are not in the business of providing sort of baseline explainers. And even even in my role running in you know, a very large encyclopedia for the Internet, one of the things that we have struggled with is like if there is no actual positive information around something or to, to counter the negative, um, no one thinks to create it. I think the the counter example, actually, and I think you'll see probably more of this, at least in the Wikipedia space, is um, speaking of vaccines, uh, of the COVID-19 vaccine. Well, there there is none right now, uh, yet we have an article on Wikipedia that talks about the fact that there is none and instead discusses all of um, the efforts to try to create one. Now, that fills an information void when people are looking for information about uh, a COVID-19 vaccine, despite the fact that there is no COVID-19 vaccine. And so we just, uh, the, the concept of information voids now popularized out I tried to just do a quick search like when does the electoral college certify there is terrible information relative to what is produced either in sort of google info boxes or quick explainers you would think that that would be the sort of thing that might be um, something that the U.S. government would put out no, nothing is immediately available on a quick google search on that sort of information yeah, I think that speaks to a really important point um, and something that I've been trying to bring up with election administrators when I've been talking to them this fall. You know, they're like, how do we push back against these crazy narratives about what we're doing and that we're the deep state, blah, 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 that sort of thing. And I'm like, you need to be proactively communicating. Um, so many of our government institutions and frankly, media need to start pulling back the curtain on what it is they do on a daily basis from a very human way. And somebody I think that does a really great job uh, with this is Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez in her Instagram lives and Facebook lives where she just talks about her day, right? Imagine if an election administrator who has been working for the past you know, year, let's say, uh, to protect the integrity of the coming vote were to say, come with me on my my day, you know, local, uh, local citizens of, you know, insert state here, my my neighbors, come follow me around and see what I do and the ways that we are, you know, working for you. We are humans. Um, so much of the time we lose that humanity and we lose that proactive communication. And too, too often, uh, especially in the government space, we only see uh, the government reaching out to folks in the media or constituents directly when there's a fire to put out. We need to preempt that. And especially in the information space, although I don't totally agree with the idea that more information is, is better and that, you know, the good information will drown out the bad. I think that's clear on the internet that doesn't always happen. Um, the more we're getting in front of that narrative and not allowing malign actors to control it, uh, that, you know, that gives us the upper hand when we are in a crisis situation. And that's the sort of work that I did when I was in Ukraine advising the uh, foreign ministry there on strategic communications. But it's hard work. I mean, it takes creativity and, and dedication that when you're in the midst of doing something like, I don't know, fighting a war in Ukraine or administering an election here, it's really hard to do. But we have to start to make that part of the reflexes of, of outreach and communication um, during the Internet era and during the era of disinformation. Yeah, com completely agree um, with with both points. I mean, if you look at um, just in terms of raw numbers of what kinds of um, um, sites 
with content talking about using the example of the coronavirus vaccine, for example, um, where they're reaching just in terms of numbers, how many people they're reaching, how many people they're engaging and all of that. We're talking about a difference of, of millions. Um, the top websites that are getting their content that is conspiratorial, that is extremely fringe, that is super hyper partisan and sensational, and in some cases, you know, very, very, very straight up false, um, their reach is in the millions higher um, than looking at more reputable news sources, um, like sort of those, those newspapers of record uh, in the United States. And part of that is um, looking at the architecture that they have all built for themselves on social media, where um, if, you, if you start to map these websites, they have extensive amounts of Facebook pages in which they just flood those pages with content all day long. Um, private groups, public groups, all of those things, social media accounts across you know, all of the social media platforms where they are just frankly um, out communicating all of the reputable and legitimate sources. That's a problem. I think that dovetails so nicely, Cindy, with something that Nina just talked about in terms of institutional trust and that human face, right? So we we know through research that um, a, younger generations, in particular, tend to trust uh, refer, refer and it's not, um, like trust networks of uh, influencers, and I don't mean social media influencers, influencers, although those two trust their network of influencers better than they trust um, institutions, right? And so one of the big issues that we have in this entire conversation is the collapse of institutional trust. It is the collapse of national public confidence in institutions. And I don't just mean institutions like the New York Times, I mean, literal institutions in this it, sorry, I mean, not literal institutions, I mean, figurative institutions like the institution of um, of the judicial system or the institution of um, electoral democracy, right? So we're having these challenges relative to the collapse of trust in institutions. And we also have this transition of trust over to individual influencers. And a lot of the institutions that we would like to see have more weight on the body politic or on public discourse have not made the um, transition into building that human relationship that, that creates that sort of influencer space that people then trust and, and um, engage with. And so instead you have these totally faceless institutions that people have no point of contact with because they're not as present in the dynamics of trust today. And I think that that's a really big, significant piece of the challenge. And as Cindy has mentioned, the, the influencers are on a lot of different social media platforms, including Facebook, for example, right? And I think when we think about 2016, a lot of our focus was originally on Twitter, largely because the data were available on that platform. But obviously, we know that disinformation exists on Facebook, public and private groups, Tumblr, Reddit, TikTok, Instagram, if it's, you know, if this a social media platform exists, there's likely a lot of disinformation on it. And so how should we think about that just in terms of, you know, what we know from 2016, but also what we can kind of expect for 2020 in terms of that? Uh I mean, I can start. I think there's a lot to say here. So, um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I think um, you're you're absolutely right describing it, Joe, in terms of the number of social media platforms where um, false content is intentionally being hosted um, as social media platforms have on some topics to some extent, to some degree, um, cracked down on particular areas and groups. Um, people have sort of fled in some cases um, to these more fringe platforms that are sort of billed as free speech platforms. Um, and, you know, what a what a ready menu of targets for um, nefarious actors looking to use false information. You've got um, the mainstream social media platforms like Facebook that have increasingly um, moved in their quote unquote pivot to privacy, which Nina and I have written about together um, previously into these um, very um, sort of thematic kinds of groups um, where you can find your cohort, your community of people who believe exactly A, B, and C like you do, um, that creates this sort of menu of, of options and the social media platforms are, you know, doing varying levels of, um, of uh, clamping down on um, the kinds of content that are, that are being spread in those kinds of 
very specific groups, but then you also have these other platforms where, again, that promote themselves as free speech, where nothing is being done. And so for a threat actor using false information as a weapon, those are those are both great options for you, right? It, they're both sort of excellent targets. Yeah, I think one of the big conversations that needs to be had with regards to disinfo is, is you know, we can't just play whack-a-troll um, and the social media platforms have to recognize that uh, the very infrastructure that they've created and the monetization of our data, the monetization of our eyeballs and engagement um, benefits bad actors. And it goes back to what I was saying before about engaging content being enraging content or emotional content. Um, Throughout the summer, since Cindy and I wrote that piece uh, for Wired about Facebook groups and how they gave it the headline, they are destroying America, which is maybe a little farther than I would have gone, but it's not that far from the truth. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we've seen over and over so many leaks. In May, there was one from the Wall Street Journal about a study that Facebook did that showed how groups were radicalizing people. Then we've seen over and over all of these leaks that are showing, it, they know, they know that uh, frankly, the way that the engagement runs on the platform, the fact that this emotional content is what drives their profit, um, it, they're ignoring it. They're ignoring it and benefiting from it and not just benefiting from, you know, $100,000 worth of Russian ads, but but the content that is constantly in the top 10, the most overperforming, most engaging content on Facebook is, again, that stuff that's highly, highly emotional. I'm picking on Facebook right now because we do have slightly more data than some of the other platforms. It is also the most ubiquitous platform here in the United States, so I think it is fair to pick on them. Um, but we need to get to the bottom of this infrastructure problem and the, the monetization problem. You know, as uh, Shiva Vaid Hayanathan from UVA uh, often says, the problem with Facebook is Facebook. And um, that can go for all of social media. You know, the, the, the way that the platform works, the fact that their economic interests are directly tied in to engagement, and then that runs on this emotional content often false and misleading information, uh, it, it's a huge problem. And that's where we need, you know, regulatory action to step in to make sure that there is more transparency for consumers so they understand, you know, the information environment they're operating, why they're being targeted, wh why they're being targeted the way they are for certain things. Um, but we also need oversight so that, you know, when Facebook says we have this ad library and look at all the things that we're complying with, uh, even, even though the Honest Ads Act hasn't been passed yet, um, that, you know, there's somebody saying, yes, you actually are doing all the things that you say you are. None of this content is slipping through the cracks. You're not treating certain content different than others just because there are powerful people that are attached to that content. We don't have any of that right now. Um, and I think this is the ecosystem that disinformers are going to continue to manipulate and find loopholes in until we have some regulatory mechanism. And to be clear, I don't want Congress to play whack-a-troll either. I don't want, you know, content moderation in the hands of our lawmakers. I think we've seen uh, on Capitol Hill every time there's a tech hearing that that is something that no one wants. Uh, but we do need to create some rules of the road. Right now we're at a bumper a bowling alley that has absolutely no bumpers and we're just, we're, you know, throwing turkeys constantly. Um, we need to, we need to step on this. We are abdicating our role right now, not only our responsibility to our own citizens, but to citizens around the world of democracies that can't get Mark Zuckerberg on their, you know, uh, the floor of their legislature to, to testify. Um, this is going to have ripple effects everywhere. So that's the end of my soapbox moment, but we, we need action on, on regulation in order to solve this problem. Totally. I yeah, love and panels I in which there's, on, dis on sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I love panels in which there's disagreement, but you've got none from me. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you hit on something so important, Nina, that there's, you know, things that the governments can do, things that social media platforms can do, things that journalists can do, and things that individuals can do. And so the three of you ladies are very much on the forefront of disinformation, combating disinformation and, and trying to prevent it in our you know, media ecosystem. And so um, for the folks who are, who are watching at home, what are some of the things that we should really be thinking about in terms of those groups governments, social media platforms, journalists, and individuals to combat disinformation. Um, and if you don't mind, we can start with you, Catherine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sure. No, no, it's fine. I'm like, great. I'm making notes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, I think I think that Nina sort of hit part of the net, or hit the nail on the head on on her analysis of uh, the business model is the problem, and like let's be really clear about that. Quarterly earnings reports are the problem. The incentive structure to be able to beat those on a quarter by quarter basis is the problem. The platform is the problem, <laughs> and until we address that and we address that openly and we recognize that the infrastructure of Facebook is corrosive to our democracy, we are not going to be able to move forward. So, like that said, um, I think that you know the, you make Nina made all their excellent points. One of which is we need a more comprehensive regulatory framework. We don't necessarily have a model right now for where that would sit relative to our, our current regulatory structure, but it doesn't preclude us from building one, right? And I think that one of the things that we often see experts point to is, you know, financial regulation, there are there are flaws. I think we're all very evident, you know, we see that in our not so distant past, but but financial regulation is a form of co-regulation very often that works more effectively than simply saying regulation is hard and so therefore we shouldn't do it. Um, I know that we see some models relative to some of the work that's going on in Europe. I think France has been experimenting over the course of the last 18 months with an effort to try to meaningfully engage the platforms, not from the basis of um, pure legislation or censorship, but really trying to say, like, what does it mean to work with the platforms internal to and have access to policy decisions within the platforms uh, for the better, for the greater stewardship of, of the sort of body uh, of the potty public. Uh, so so seeing some sort of responsibility on that, I, I would really like to see uh, Congress step up and, and take action. Those uh, hearings are appalling, uh, frankly. Um, in terms of their sort of political posturing, uh, from a from a media perspective, I think that greater service journalism, honestly, is really sort of the way that I would like to see the media move, which is explaining the way that our systems work um, and explaining them at a level that gets into the granular details um, for on a state by state basis and, and recognizing that that's actually quite challenging given the sort of demise of local news, uh, needing to see these national uh, institutions step up and engage in local journalism. And I know it's not nearly as profitable and that's not why and that's why they don't do it. But nonetheless, um, you know, relative to the independence and, and the sort of continuity of, a, of the press as the fourth estate, if they want to be the fourth estate, take responsibility for being the fourth estate. Um, when it comes to the role of individuals, I think that, you know, one of the things that we often point to is, is of course, media literacy. And that, that's a hard ask of people, given the volume of information that comes at them day in and day out. Um, I think that that's really where co-designing information platforms, whether it is uh, the publication of in terms of the press or or social media platforms so that we're emphasizing the um, the design of news delivered delivery or information delivery to uh, surface more of the contextual clues that uh, that users need or people need to be able to filter information is so critically important. Very, you know, I think one of the biggest criticisms of Facebook in, uh, in the 2016 election was uh, the way that they productized links, essentially stripped out all contextual information. And so um, I, there was a, I don't remember the name of it, maybe Cindy and Nina, you probably do. Uh, oh, the example I always go back to was in, in call, there was a fake, um, a uh, fake newspaper out of Colorado, or at least associated with Colorado. It was like the Denver Press or something like that. It doesn't actually exist, but stripped of all contextual information like hyperlinks uh, and the like, you know, users would see that information productized and delivered into their newsfeed in a way that looked incredibly credible. Uh, you also would see this with the recirculation of information that was years out of date, uh, being republicized as though it was new because there was no contextual information as to the source of this information and the time period of its initial publishing. Uh, I, you know, very often a classic example of this is even in, you know, take away the social media platforms, look at news information. When you go to a major uh, newspaper these days, without the context of being able to flip from page to page in a physical product, it's hard to know when you've entered into the op-ed section for example. Um, and the, the very nature of the way that we label and present this information makes it more difficult for news consumers to be able to, at first glance, understand what it is that they're looking for. So, I mean, 
critical reading is certainly something that we believe in um, at Wikimedia. We believe that people actually are when given the opportunity to be informed and informed that information might not always be right. And so therefore, please take a critical read. People actually tend to do that, but it requires a socialization that steps down from the hubris of the, of, of the sort of national media and says, actually, we don't always get this right. I think you're seeing, at least in the conversations that we've been having with mm -hmm. the national press, um, a, a real sense of responsibility and concern uh, when it comes into calling this election and reporting on this election, I'd like to see how long that lasts. Certainly they're talking totally. a good and game I, right now. Yeah, and I wanna bring uh, Nina and Cindy into this, your comment on media literacy and civic information and knowledge and where um, that information should be coming from. So Catherine, you had mentioned journalists. Are there other places where we should see, you know, a f some some information education on either civic knowledge or media literacy. Cindy, um, Nina, feel free. Yeah, I mean, so I do a fair amount of work um, on on you know while most of my time is focused on the investigative side of all of this and and hunting bad actors. The other piece of my life that I that I focus um, this work on is. Um, doing um, education primarily aimed at the high school student um, age. Um, and it's, you know, focused on providing teachers, librarians, educators in general with the tools that they need to learn how to teach their students the sort of very basics of information analysis. What questions do you ask yourself when you see content? Um, recognizing how certain content makes you feel a certain way and what that could be sort of a sign of and what you should do as a result once you have that information. Um, you know, in interacting with these with these educators, this is across the United States um, in, you know, different states uh, on from coast to coast, they they say that they don't have the tools. They, they reach out um, to have speakers and things like that. They might have some um, some technology that they have access to through their school to teach things like digital media literacy, but they mostly say that they don't have the information that they need to be able to teach the, the, their classrooms, right, the kinds of basic tools and tactics to employ when they're confronting information. Um, I think part of it, you know, we sort of have to think about the evolution of information and technology um, throughout the generations and, you know, my generation of um, of individuals, we got internet in our home for the first time sort of when I was growing up. That's the generation that I come from. I went from using things like actual hard copy encyclopedias to now having Wikipedia online, which is wonderful. Um, but, you know, my generation was confronted with having to learn on the fly technology as it was being built. This new generation has technology, you know, is online essentially from the moment their parents are taking pictures of them in the delivery room. Um, and so they're leading a very different sort of life um, in terms of the amount of information that they're consuming on a daily basis. We created this giant architecture of technology and social media, this fire hose of information, and then we throw it on them sort of day one and say, like, go figure it out when we sort of haven't figured it out ourselves, even though we've built it. Um, and so that's where I think um, it was Catherine, you who mentioned earlier about um, the extent to which sort of younger generations rely on influencers. Um, both sort of in one's network and also influencers in terms of social media influencers. Um, you know, I, I think that because we've sort of handed this younger generation this giant information mess and given them, given them the technology to help sort of make the mess worse <laughs> um, and spread the mess uh, faster and farther than we've ever been able to throughout history, we haven't then also given them the tools to figure out how to not do that in return. And so I do focus a lot of my work on providing um, things like explainers and infographics and, you know, all the way down to um, how does social media work um, kinds of explainers to um, to educators that they can deploy in the classroom because they need the foundations, the analytic foundations to confront what we have sort of thrown at them. Yeah, I, I think that is valiant and really important work. Um, so thank you for doing that, Cindy. Uh, and I would also add that I think, you know, we, we do spend a lot of time talking about media literacy in um, a K through 12 kind of space. 
Um, but I think it's also really important to figure out the ways that we can reach voting age adults. And Cindy touched on libraries. I am super bullish on libraries. I don't know if we have any librarians in the audience, but um, if you look, they are incredibly trusted in society, in American society. Can you think of an institution that's trusted anymore? Because I'm not sure I can. Um, and librarians somehow are still maintaining that trust. So um, I would love to see in the future a government program that is directing grants to local libraries uh, to do this sort of nonpartisan, absolutely apolitical media literacy, digital literacy training for adults, um, in particular for our uh, grandparents' generation, for adults over the age of 50 who have, you know, gone through life with um, basically somebody curating content for them right? Um, they're used to trusting what they see on a screen coming through, and they've not yet developed the reflexes necessary to uh, to really go through that content in a, in a critical way. So I think that's incredibly, incredibly important. I do want to circle back to, to something that Catherine said regarding the media and local news deserts, vacuums. Um, this is another hobby horse of mine, but the United States only spends $3 per person per year on public media in this country. Uh, and NPR and PBS are often the only local stations that are covering uh, the news from a local perspective in these news deserts, in America's heartland, in the South, and in other rural areas. Um, and I just think it is absolutely despicable that we would spend so little, so little on, uh, on the well-informed public um and frankly you know as somebody who does a lot of commentary and this isn't to to ding any of our our colleagues in the for-profit media but the type of interview that i get to do when i go on pbs or npr versus a cable news network it's it's night and day i mean it's a soundbite versus a nuanced conversation and the more that we can be returning america to that nuance uh, i think the better off we would be now i know there are going to always be people who have problems with, you know, a, a huge investment in the media. But even if we ticked that up by a couple of cents per person per year, we'd be in a much better state. And still, as I'm sure everyone who is watching today knows, uh, even with that investment, the $3 per person per year that we spend, uh, there, most of our NPR and PBS affiliates are supported by donations still to this day. Um, they, they run almost entirely on that. So I would love to see us invest more in, uh, in journalism as a public service. And, and yes, the for-profit institutions should continue to exist, but everyone in, in the United States should have access to good information. Every child should have access to good educational content on TV that PBS provides and that sort of thing. And I really think um, that is one way that we can, you know, again, invest in that resilience of society that uh, if you look at the countries who have more resiliency, places like Finland and Sweden, Germany has has issues with, uh, with disinformation, of course, but they still have a very strong uh, tradition of the local press there. Even Ukraine, to some extent, understands the importance of investing in the media, even though they are in this really dire information situation. Uh, it's clear that this is part of the solution. And I hope that um, there is you know, a bipartisan push to equip people with better, nuanced, nonpartisan information in the future. That makes my little journalism professor heart so happy to hear just like the importance <laughs> of, of local journalism and really emphasizing that. Um, we have a couple of questions from the audience, so I'm going to start fielding them, unless there's any kind of last minute comments from the last question. Well, one thing that hasn't come up at all is also just the disparities within America, um, other than the local urban divide, I think that, or, you know, urban density divide, um, specifically on this point, I just want to make sure that we are being very explicit about it. News media tends not only to cover on places that are highly populous, but also places with uh, greater economic um, capital, right? And so we're talking about the exclusion of uh, folks who are closer to uh, economic vulnerability, but we're also talking about the exclusion of black and brown communities relative to coverage and engagement. And so I just think it's really important because we ha it hasn't come up yet uh, that this is, this is something that we need to address in the context of this election and going forward.
forward. Uh, to everything Nina just said, I, I know that that probably was at the core of what you were saying. And I, and I know that public media has had a real reckoning um, or is trying to have a reckoning, maybe hasn't fully reckoned yet um, with some of these nat the nature of exclusion. And so I just wanted to make sure that we, we, we put that out there because I think that probably that's something that seeing a lot of nods. Um, but Joe, I don't, I, you know, you I, over to you. You're the journalism professor. You probably <laughs> have a lot to say about that. <laughs> Well, so the first, actually, the first audience question is about cable news, which I thought was really interesting since we were just talking about local journalism and public news. And so this question asks, cable news has contributed heavily to dividing our society. What do you think should be the future of cable news? Imagine a household where one person sits and watches MSNBC and the other person sits and watches Fox News. They get completely different approaches to the news of the day. Whew. <laughs> That's a hard one. So it made me think of uh, during the the Helsinki summit uh, between Putin and, and Trump in 2018, I was on a cruise in Alaska. Uh, really terrible timing on my part, um, but especially as a Russia person. But uh, on the on the cruise, the only media that were available were MSNBC and, and Fox, I guess, because they had paid to to beam themselves onto the cruise ship. And absolutely, it was like watching two two different uh absolutely different you know versions of reality um i don't know that in the united states there is an appetite to go back to kind of the fairness doctrine that used to exist for tv news uh, i do not think we will ever go toward having Ofcom, um, the Office for Communications that they do in the UK, where um, you know there there's actual consequences when you're reporting something that is wildly different from, uh, from the truth uh, in a systemic way. Um, frankly, I don't know what the answer to this is. And, and this is where I do think, you know, uh, making public media, not to get back to my, my favorite topic, but making public media more attractive to listeners, making sure that, you know, uh, the PBS NewsHour has the, the same, perhaps not the same resources, but more resources to make their, their programming as compelling as what people, the flashy things people are seeing in the partisan media landscape. Um, I think that's part of, part of the solution. I, I don't have the whole solution, but I do believe that's key. I, I think, you know, advocating for an omnivorous diet uh, relative to your news media is really important. Um, the idea that you would listen to MSNBC and CNN and, and, and PBS and Fox News, I know that's probably not reasonable for most people, but at least more than one source uh, tends to create a better and more informed um, individual if, if you're actually grazing rather than sort of um, just, just eating at one location. Um, but what I would actually also say is I think that there's... A, to Nina's point, uh, there, the funding mechanisms really matter. And there have been campaigns over the past few years to, to essentially, whether you like it or not, or whether you support it or not, deplatform some of the more controversial Fox News hosts by defunding their commercial budgets. Um, and I think that there is a real question for us as consumers, not just of the news, but of the American economy as to uh, who advertises where and what do we want, what do we choose to support? Um, because some of this more outrageous sort of divisive narratives that come through, you know, that's not coming through on CNN. Um, and yeah, I've sort of got my criticisms of MSNBC at times, um, but, you know, thinking really around what it is that who supports what relative to enabling some of the, again, more divisive and hateful rhetoric to occur on, on our television stations really it comes down to economic incentives. And so what is our power as individual consumers, not just, I mean, as citizens and consumers uh, to be able to address this? That's such a great point. What information do we want right in our ecosystem? And how do we as consumers of that put our money where our mouth is essentially? Another audience question. How do we talk to our right wing family members about disinformation and conspiracy theories. So much of these theories are self-sealing. When someone tries to disprove them or say they're wrong, it just becomes evidence of a bigger conspiracy theory. So how do we talk about this when truth has no meaning anymore? And I think this ties really nicely with just our previous conversation about just watching MSNBC or just watching Fox News. There are, you know, that perception of the echo chamber. You're only going to see information that aligns with one perspective. Um, and so I think 
in some ways, conspiracy theories are related to that. Um, I, I, I can kick us off, but I'm very interested in hearing what, what both Nina and Catherine have to say on this particular issue. Um, I say often that this is the number one question that I that I get um, from from individuals. And um, from that perspective, it actually it's one of the reasons that I have hope that we can tackle this issue to some degree, because people are still interested in engaging and having these conversations and they just want to find the right strategy to do it. So that actually provides me with a lot of hope, um, which I'm always looking for these days. Um, so I think the way that I tend to talk about this is more a sort of list of what not to do in these conversations. So um, I, I always start by saying that you will never win an argument in a comment section um, of a social media post or a news article. It's just not going <laughs> to happen. So um, <laughs> particularly if it's between like two individuals who don't know each other, but also, you know, between people who do know each other, um, a sort of public confrontation in the comment section, you are not going to have a successful dialogue. Similarly, um, approaching a conversation as under the mindset of you can win um, is also very unhelpful because it's going to alter the kinds of ways that you engage with this with the other person. Um, if you're doing it under the idea of like, you could potentially win this argument. Um, the third thing that I would mention is that um, you're never going to be successful really when the conversation is one side mustering their sources that confirm what they're saying from their partisan lens and you bringing your, uh, you know, arsenal, if you will, of, of sources that say what you're trying to say under your sort of ideological alignment. Those sources are just never going to meet. Um, you're going to continue to butt heads. And so, all I can say is sort of what has helped me in the past. And I say this coming from being a former CIA officer who people's uh, people in my network still do legitimately believe in the deep state, no matter how many times I say there is no deep state. Um, rather, you have a bunch of, you know, public servants who are trying their very best to keep the company protected, safe and running on a daily basis. Um, and their retort is usually, well, maybe you just didn't get your, your offer to join the deep state. So you just don't know that it's happening and you know, they just didn't want you involved. Um, so I, that's the sort of background that I come to these conversations yeah. with sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I've often found that a productive way of, of talking with individuals is to try to personalize the issue as much as possible. If you look at, for example, coronavirus, a lot of the individuals who believe that it's a hoax is because they have not personally experienced or had the impact of coronavirus. They don't know anybody who's been sick. If they did know somebody who was sick, it was a lighter case of it. They haven't personally confronted the tragedy that coronavirus has, has brought to so many people's lives. And so personalizing the issue um, can be really helpful. So conversations where, you know, if it's, uh, if it's somebody who's denying that climate change exists, being able to say, you know, hey, we live by a lake. You have seen the toll that it takes on, on the water, on the wildlife, on the landscape, when, for example, just for one weekend, the 4th of July maybe, we have a bunch of um, out-of-town tourists who come and dump their garbage into the lake. They do all of these terrible things. You've seen the effect of that. Okay, so spin it out, right? Oceans, air, all of these things that have been, we've done to our environment for, for millennia at this point. Um, why would that not have an effect on the earth as well? That sort of personalizing um, I have found has been a little more effective in, in these kinds of conversations because we treat information as such a personal experience. That's a really great piece of advice. Nina, did you have any recommendations? Yeah, I would agree with everything that Cindy's saying, and I apologize, it's garbage day in my neighborhood, so it might be a bit noisy at the moment. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> I would, I would say the only thing I would add, definitely take things out of public, you know, message people privately if you can, if you can manage doing that. Um, actually, I'll add two things. So on that note, if it's somebody that you know coming at it um, from an inquisitive point of view, not just saying you're wrong and let me tell you why, even if you personalize it, um, I think being like, I saw that you shared that 
article, I was wondering what spoke to you about it. So you can understand where they're coming from. I think that's really important and then approach it um, again from that human level. Um, the second thing, especially for, um, for women or minorities who are online, uh, I know Cindy and I have both dealt with um, some trolling uh, I know, I'm sure Catherine has, has dealt with some of the similar things just being um, in the public eye, especially as a woman. Uh, if somebody's not engaging with you in good faith, um, give, give them one reply and then just stop. I mean, I, it's hard for me to do this sometimes, but uh, <laughs> otherwise we're just feeding that ecosystem um, and giving the, the trolls essentially what they want. I know that the question specifically was about convincing people of, of you know, uh, that they are, you know, feeding into disinformation, but we also have to recognize the role that we play. And it can be extremely frustrating when you are dealing with abuse online to not defend yourself. Um, but these people don't want you to defend yourself there. It's, it's just feeding more into that ecosystem of engagement and yeah. enragement, right? So, um, right. They're not the communicating we... in good faith. Yeah. Yeah. So just if, if you really don't think someone's asking you a question from a place of curiosity, then it's probably best not to uh, engage at all. As much as these tools are meant to provide us with that engagement, um, there are a lot of people with ulterior motives. And so I've had to kind of school myself about that uh, a lot recently. I, I think I would just keep keep it quick, but the last two things that I would say is it actually reminds me of the very first treatment orientation. Um, well, my, my only treatment orientation, my treatment orientation uh, nearly 10 years ago, start from a place of values, start from a place of shared goals. Uh, what is it that you're both trying to achieve together? Do you both believe in the ability of your communities to be secure and safe? Okay, let's let's start from there and understand what that means for for each of us relative to our our own context and try to start to open up a conversation from that. I mean, one thing that Wikipedia has is really fascinating for is actually uh, our articles are better the more diversity of opinion you have, and so the best possible, highest quality articles are the ones that engage uh, people across a variety of different perspectives, often hotly contested tested perspectives, but because they have a shared goal, which is to publish information on the website and make it stick, uh, it forces them to negotiate to a point of agreement. Um, and so it might be that you agree on very little, but that point of agreement is the beginning of building something much larger. That's such a great point. Thank you all. Okay. One more question. How might, President, uh, how might the president's COVID diagnosis affect coronavirus misinformation in the United States, especially in such a turbulent election time? And we're gonna start with Nina. Sure, um, so I haven't got, gotten a chance to really delve deep into this yet, but already the misinformation and disinformation is flying uh, in some of the groups that I monitor, saying things about, you know, this was either manufactured by the Biden campaign or the, you know, Trump is just trying to do this in order to push his uh, remedies coming from the left. So we, the, the most important thing is that we don't know very much right now and that it's up to all of us not to engage uh, in, in that speculation. I think the news media um, might be especially guilty of this. I have deliberately disengaged from social media and some, some of the coverage online today because I, oh, I don't, really? until we know, I don't really want to know very much more. Um, and so I think we all need to slow down. Uh, I do think it is absolutely ripe for, for conspiracy theories to be planted. Um, and the social media companies are gonna really need to be on the lookout about that stuff. I'm not sure how this act interacts with their policies on health misinformation, because uh, unless some sort of cure or something uh, is being pushed by the articles, I don't think it will have an effect on public safety, but it does certainly have an effect on, you know, our, our de democratic discourse ahead of the election. Um, especially if there are changes to the debates or to campaigning or things like that. But this is just a big unknown and it's absolutely just a fertile ground for conspiracies and disinformation to be planted. And we are going to see a lot of them. So again, practice informational distancing and take care of yourselves. Totally. Cindy, your thoughts on coronavirus misinformation with the recent diagnosis? Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, just yet another um, sort of crisis scenario in which um, people who are intentionally spreading everything from, you know, intentionally false information to conspiracy theories, this is just a, a perfect scenario for them. And so, you know, I sort of would advise the way that I would advise on, on handling any sort of breaking news um, issue, which is um, to you know, to pause, to understand that you're going to be absolutely bombarded with information, claims, speculation,
from every source on every platform um, as this event progresses, um, that there are individuals and um, malign actors looking to take advantage of exactly this scenario. Um, watch out for how speculation and conspiracy theories become so repeated on so many different platforms that people start to talk about them as truth and fact. Um, and that essentially you should stick with what we know at this point from reputable sources of information, um, legitimate media outlets that are reporting uh, what they know as they know it and understand that that could change and it doesn't decrease their, um, you know, their legitimacy as a news outlet because things change, events move, it, we gain new in, more information. And so um, stick with what we know, don't engage in speculation. Great. Catherine? Yeah, I was online last night on the West Coast when this news broke. And I think the best advice I saw was stop doom scrolling. Like we don't have more information, Ooh. right? Um, at this point in time, I, I think, you know, from a public health standpoint, my biggest concern is, is obviously for the, um, for what is best for our nation. I, 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 I think that there is a very, um, I, I very much hope that this is a very mild case of coronavirus, right? But I think as well, there is a concern relative to how the uh, this plays out, that people will feel uh, validated that the virus isn't real, feel validated that it's no worse than the flu, um, that that may perpetuate misinformation relative to public health. And I think that that is a genuine concern. Um, we also have to recognize that there are very wildly differing health outcomes based on uh, access to health services. And so just because it, you know, we have the you know probably the best medical care in the world for the president of the United States, um, it doesn't mean that somebody who uh, has a similar set of underlying conditions or preconditions is going to have a positive outcome. And so I'm genuinely worried about the public health impacts of this. Uh, what I will say, you know, on the stop doom scrolling piece is one of the paradoxical truths of our information environment right now is sometimes less reading of the news makes you a better news consumer. Um, stepping away uh, and not reading every single thing that comes in front of you and, and actually waiting for the things that filter through, through uh, what, what becomes the top line narratives of the day, a slow news approach, if you will. Um, I don't know anything new today. You you know, 12 hours later after that diagnosis than I did last night. Um, it doesn't matter if I've read the news or not, nothing new has emerged. And so stepping away from the news can sometimes make you more informed. I hate it's, it's a bizarre thing to say, particularly as an avid news junkie, but it's true. But that's so important, right? For both, you know, someone's mental health and to make sure that they're getting news and incorrect and, and, and information. Correct Stop doom scrolling, drink water. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Great, great advice. We're gonna take one last, we're gonna take one last audience question and then I'm gonna ask the panelists for just a couple final words before we wrap up this panel. But the last audience question that I wanna ask is, 2015-16 forecasted what we are dealing with in the 2019-2020 election. What, if anything from 2019 or 2020, should we be on the lookout for in the 2024 cycle? I'm going to just start with Cindy. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we're going to know a lot more about, um, you know, different coordinated efforts to target this particular election after the election. And so I think it's going to be a period of time for us to do a lot of research and analysis um, I think, you know, there's a reason why we all, all of us in this, in this space continue to talk to, about 2016, um, all the way to 2018. And that's because we're continuously learning more and more about, um, what particularly foreign actors did, but also domestic actors as well to target that particular election. Um, so I think, um, you know, I think we're going to have a lot of lessons learned, um, for, for after the fact, and I'm looking forward to engaging with with all of my colleagues in this space to do sort of um, debriefs um, of all of our experiences after the fact. But I think, you know, I think given that we're in this sort of infodemic environment, um, we especially have some lessons learned to think about in terms of um, the, the, the strategies and how those have evolved from different um, disinformation threat actors who particularly were able to potentially, you know, be successful in this period because the infodemic, um, you know, that we have experienced, uh, whilst being under a global pandemic, has been such a unique period of time, um, sort of in the in the evolution of information. Um, so I think we're going to have a lot of lessons learned in terms of um, 
the success, the success of, of different actors to um, leverage um, a very crisis, uh, you know, an extended crisis period to um, allow their narratives to gain more traction. Um, and I think, you know, we're in for um, some some rocky weeks ahead, particularly um, depending on how the election results are um, are rolled out, uh, how things things go on that front. And so um, it really could sort of set set the next couple of of years even up for us, depending on on those particular weeks and, and the first few months to come. So. Totally. And I think it goes back to one of Catherine's earlier points in the beginning of the panel that a lot of this misinformation, disinformation is going to come out after the election, right? And in that period where we're not quite sure, you know, what's going on, what the results are, that sort of thing. Um, Catherine, your thoughts? Yeah, I actually am so glad you opened up that opportunity. I think that the thing that people should be looking for is that 24, 48 uh, hour period. It will go on for a week, but I think we're going to know a lot in the first 48 hours. I think we might not even know a lot in the first 24 hours. There's been a lot of sort of like, we need to hold steady. We don't know who the winner is going to be. I think it's going to be pretty indicative in those first 24 to 48. It won't be possible necessarily to call it, but statistically speaking, we'll probably have a good good understanding. Um, the thing that has been pointed out to me uh, on numerous occasions from sort of people who are focusing on the information ecosystem around this is the effect of the, the red mirage and the blue creep. And I just want to make sure that our, our viewers are familiar with these terms, the red mirage being the person because uh, counties that are less densely populated in a very large country tend to report in sooner, the map tends to go red very quickly. Um, that is a representation of geography, not of actual ballot, uh, you know, ballot indications, right? It's who won what counties. Um, and then as more densely situated, settled areas tend to come in, those tend to be bluer. And so you, and particularly as you go west, you see the whole map tend to shift over the course of a number of hours. However, although this is a very well-documented effect that has been on, underway for the last 20 or so years, um, that does create an opportunity for misinformation and active disinformation to set in, uh, particularly as uh, people claim sort of initial advantage or you know uh, accusations that that very um, well-established effect is uh, evidence of some sort of electoral tampering. I think that we're going to have to really look out for that. And so what might an outcome be for 2024 would be let's report on that better, right? Like let's actually invest in the intervening four years on educating the body politic on what this means. The last two things that I would say really quickly is I think that the platforms um, for all of their flaws, the social media platforms have really tried to step up their efforts around moderation of COVID information. And I, I apologize, I don't know if it was Cindy or Nina who made the point that this has really been around health outcomes um, with the argument that health outcomes are life and death. Well, I, I would like to make the argument that so are politics. And so I would like to see platforms learn that life and death, particularly and um, for you know marginalized communities, communities outside of the United States, you know fragile, fragile institutions and governments, uh, it is really important that social media uh, companies take that responsibility in the same way that they felt like they could uncontroversially take that responsibility vis-a-vis -vis COVID. They've learned. Let's see them deploy those same tools. And then the last thing I would say is I think it's really evident as well that if we want to build for better outcomes relative to social media platforms and how they handle this, they need to build for community outcomes rather than individualized experiences, because it's actually the collective outcome on our societies that is causing the problem. Um, relative to the fact that what they are chasing is individual user engagement. So let's start building for communities rather than individualized user engagement. And those would be my two requests to the platforms and one to the news media. Great. Nina, 2024. What should we expect? Uh, all right, 30 seconds. Well, I mean, I think this has always been about democracy, right? Uh, right now, I think the trend is the denigration of our democracy from within. That's what disinformation is capitalizing on. Let's not let that happen. Um, make you know your voice heard, vote, engage with the democratic system. That is the way, uh, the holistic way to fight back against all this. <laughs> yeah, we have we have a couple more minutes. Actually, they're, they're letting us go a little bit longer. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, which I think is great because I, I want us you know, to have an opportunity for you to have any final words about things that maybe we haven't talked about or um, things that you really, really want people to think about as we move much, much closer in the last, you know, 30 some days before the election. Catherine, what are any last final comments or thoughts? 
I mean, I think I would reinforce exactly what Nina said. I think we have a very informed audience here. And so my hope is that everyone has made their plan to vote. Uh, if you have had the ability to vote already, go that, go out and do it. And then think about what more you can do to facilitate the success of the elections, but specifically to ensure that people are engaged with democracy, regardless of outcome. Um, you know, I, I remember writing my like application essay to Truman and the one <laughs> and like, why does democracy matter? The answer is, is that if we don't utilize it, it withers and dies. So let's utilize this election's opportunity to fully engage in representative democracy in every possible avenue that is available to us, including, uh, you know, engaging at, at the level of poll, poll work and election monitoring um, within our in our local communities. So I know that this this audience is already on top of it, but that's just this audience. So go out and find out where the weakest points are in your communities and start thinking about what you can do to shore them up. Great. Cindy, final comments? Yeah, I mean, sort of in that same vein, I think there is a tendency to come away from um, panels around disinformation feeling very disheartened. And so I always look to try and end with something hopeful, um, because just because we've talked about it for the last hour and 15 minutes doesn't mean that um, so that sort of the world is ending. Um, it's a very tough topic to um, to sort of deal with on a mental health level. So I think it's important to remember that there are things that we can do. This isn't a hopeless issue. Some of the things like looking for opportunities in your communities to do that, that education, like Catherine just talked about, I think are wonderful. Holding your elected uh, officials responsible, uh, making sure that they're engaging on this issue, pressuring them to and encouraging them to um, look for regulatory solutions. Um, speaking out on social media platforms, you absolutely could be doing more. Not all the social media platforms are equal in terms of the policies and capabilities that they've brought to this to confront this issue. And so we need to continue to hold them responsible as well. There are um, things that we can do looking at some of the things that Nina mentions in her book about countries exploring um, solutions. So this isn't hopeless. <laughs> Great. Nina, final comment? I think in addition to everything Catherine and Cindy just said, I would urge our legislators and their staff to really think about the ways that politicians have an effect on this ecosystem. Uh, I think we should all be taking pledges not to traffic in disinformation, deep fakes, and uh, and hacked materials. And, and we need our legislators to lead in terms of building a global coalition with other democracies that want to address this problem because um, it is a democratic problem that, as we've clearly laid out, uh, doesn't respect borders. And the, the more that we can do together, the stronger our response will be. I love that. Thank you so much, Cindy, Nina, Catherine, for combating disinformation, for participating on this panel, and for sharing all of your extensive knowledge and information about this information and, and for, for giving us hope, right? For giving us hope about 2020 and 2024 and the future of our democracy. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who joined us for this panel. Please drink water, watch your information critically, don't amplify mis and disinformation and make sure to vote. Thank you.